You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Looking forward to answering all of our community's questions here today. Every weekend, if you're new to the Cabral concept, we answer all the questions that come in from stephencabral.com forward slash ask Cabral. Just do keep in mind, they take about 12 weeks or so to get to your question. That's typically where we are. In terms of the queue, we're answering questions that came in on September 8th today to about September 19th, September 20th, depending on how many questions we get through. Typically, we get through about eight to 10 questions per show. And there are two shows every weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Love being able to give you my perspective from having seen over a quarter million people in our practice, tens of thousands of labs. I personally have seen, met with myself, over 35,000 people. So what all I'm trying to do with these podcasts is just give you the insight to hopefully save you years of frustration, years of stress, and a lot of wasted money on things that simply most likely will not pen out and work. So it is, again, a, just a nice little opportunity, I believe, that I have to be able to share some of the knowledge I've been able to pick up from my mentors from thousands of books and just from being able to see so many people. So thank you for tuning in today, as always. And let's get right into the show. Jake is up first. Jake is asking, Hi, Dr. Ball. I've been getting into your podcast on Ayurvedic medicine and really been getting into the doshas and body types. I really am seeing some trends among friends, family, and myself and wondering, uh, depending on body type. I've read a lot on the blood type diet. I'm wondering if there are any correlations with Ayurvedic medicine and blood type or the blood type diet. Thank you, Jake. Jake, this is really interesting. I spoke with my mentor many, many years ago about this because I had just spent some time up at the Dadamo Institute, who are the founders of the blood type diet. And I'd you know, gone through their protocols and kind of felt some success and not some success in some areas. And so I spoke with my mentor. And, and so she wrote the textbook of Ayurveda, Fundamental Principles. That's the yellow book, the, the first one by Vasant Lad or Vasant Lad. And there is some correlation. However, I think it's less so now because I don't know about you, but I'm about 10 different nationalities. You know, I'm not a nationality. I'm not. And so there's been, you know, a lot of, I don't know, just blending of different races, whatever, or cultures, whatever you want to say. And I think it's a great thing. A lot of people may disagree, but that's okay. We can all have our own beliefs. And with that, I'm not sure it matters as much or has this great effect anymore because I see it work sometimes and not so work other times. And the blood type diet, again, I, not that I don't believe in it, but the problem is that it's not the only thing. You can't just go by that, meaning that if, you know, if someone has candida overgrowth or SIBO or heavy metals, the blood type diet might help them look towards certain foods, but it's not going to help with the heavy metals. And it's not going to help with the candida overgrowth or the parasites or H. pylori. So there's just more to it than that. Let me give you the short answer. The Kapha body type is most closely associated with the O blood type. And the Vata body type is most closely associated with the A blood type. So what I go by that and what I say that that is solid science, I would not. But Vasant Lad says that in his book. And I, I would probably tend to agree that there's a little bit of truth to that. But again, do I go by the blood type diet? I, no offense to the blood type diet. I don't. I use I use all integrative forms of medicine. I'm not against the blood type diet, but I use state-of-the-art lab tests to see what people need. All right, Natalie's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. I'm hearing a lot of banter around the meat-only diet. People reference the Inui communities to support long-term efficacy. I would love to hear your perspective. Thank you so much, Natalie. All right, Natalie, great question. This is uh, for people that don't know about it. It's called the carnivore diet. It's very, very popular right now and, you know, a little a little far-fetched. And that's because right off the bat, we're not carnivores. I mean, just I'm going to do a whole podcast on this, so I don't I don't I want to save some of the topics that I want to speak about on that. But nothing about our body says carnivore. 
a carnivore would be more like a cat. Okay. So if you look at a cat's teeth and you look at their digestive tract and you look at their claws and knowing that they can see in the dark, knowing that they can be nocturnal, like all of that would be carnivore based. We don't have fangs. We don't have claws. We never have, even in human evolution. If you look through human evolution, and I've been doing a lot of that lately because I've, I just really want to get this down, is there is common ancestry with a basically like chimp human based hybrid. And this is going back, I believe the data was somewhere around six, seven million years ago or so. And you just can start to see the split. And the split was, well, we weren't as strong as the chimps or apes. And so we moved down. Again, this is just all hypothesis. It will always be hypothesis, to be honest with you. But we moved to the ground. But either way, we were never carnivores. Like if you look at a chimp, I mean, pretty close. We're looking at same teeth, very close in digestive tract. You're looking at 5% of their diet being meat, you know, or some type of animal-based protein. You know, again, anyone who's cute, oh, uh, quoting the Inui, they're not understanding. The Inui are eating predominantly a lot of fish and fermented-based fish, easier to digest, high in omega-3s, which is anti-inflammatory. And all they're quoting is cardiovascular risk. And I can get behind that. That's true. They have less cardiovascular risk. Eating more fish. Okay, well, I don't have a problem with that. And they're talking about long-term efficacy. Well, you have to really do the research. This is not on you, Natalie. The people that are supporting the carnivore diet are just reading other people's banter. That's it. Because if you look at the Inui, look at the results. They die on average 10 years earlier than everyone else. So even our sickly population here in the United States... Somewhere between 77, 79 years of age, people are living to the Inuit or Inuit or Inuit is 68 years. That's it. Okay. So say what you want. Their life expectancy is a decade less than even the sick people in the United States. So would I use them as my bottle of health? Not if you want to live past 68. And that's certainly my goal. So Natalie, hopefully that helps a little bit. All right. Hi, Lee's up next. Hi, Stephen and team. I want to make inquiries in regards to functional medicine lab testing and working in your private concierge practice. I've been suffering from a number of years with chronic-based illnesses. I have a history of gut issues, constipation, candida, bladder infections, eating disorder, etc. This year, having moved back home, I have thyroid issues, uh, streptococcus overgrowth, liver congestion, bowel stoppage. I've been on uh, many different supplements. I'd be considering getting some of your lab tests done and wondering if the cost is in US dollars. I'm in Australia. I've done the hair tissue mineral analysis. I've been looking at some of the supplements and different protocols, Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, let's see what else. Also, how does the call work included in the functional medicine lab test? If you're in Australia, is it just one call you get? All right. So thanks, Kelly. That's a great question. I'm going to give you help with your symptoms because I don't want to just answer how to be a part of our practice. So if you want to be a part of the private concierge practice, it's three calls. It is um, your initial intake where we go through your entire health history, really listen to your story, and not just your labs, but where you're coming from. After that, we make lab recommendations based on what we hear on that call in terms of symptoms and, and maybe other labs that you ran. So then we customize those labs for you. We ship them out to you, and then we do our next call. And by the way, um, Kylie, this is all done through Skype. So we're here in Boston and simply it, it's actually not very difficult. We do calls at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, sometimes five o'clock. And that would be morning your time. So it's, it's not that difficult. We do that every day. And then, so then your second appointment is you get your lab results. So we explain your lab results, not just give you a piece of paper and expect that you understand them because that's obviously not your profession. And then after that, we give you a customized wellness plan, which is going to include the nutrition plan. It's going to include meal plan templates, a shopping list. It'll include some initial exercise recommendations, detox if needed. So the entire de-stress protocol and supplements as well. And then all of these things can be shipped to Australia. So it's very straightforward. That's how it works. And then you also get another follow-up appointment after that. So after you start your plan, about one month later, we check in, see how you're doing, listen to all the improvements. And then if there's anything that may, needs adjustments, we make those adjustments as well. So that's exactly how we do it. You know, right off the bat, if you didn't want to be a part of the private concierge practice, well, you could just simply order the digestive-based lab kits, which would be the 
organic acids test and the stool test and the food sensitivity test and have those shipped. If you weren't able to do all three, I would recommend the organic acids test and the stool test. And then those would come to you and you get one call with that as well as a plan, but you, there would be no follow-up. That's just part of ordering a lab through equilibrium nutrition. It's still great. I mean, you get, I mean, that's what most people do. I still read all of the labs that get ordered through equilibrium nutrition. I still make my recommendations and you speak with one of my amazing health coaches and they take you through all of those things. So we do a lot of that. And of course we work with many people all over the world, not just Australia, all over Europe, Canada, UK, all over um, South America. So yes, it's something that we do every day. And of course yours does sound like not only gut-based issues, but some intestinal permeability, which is backing up the liver as well. Just because remember everything that moves through your gut wall is most likely going to be processed by the gut associated lymphoid tissue brought to the liver and the liver has to break all of that down or detoxify all that. And then it goes back to your intestines and you can keep repeating the process if you still have intestinal permeability. So not ideal. So Kylie, that's a place to get started. All of these questions though are best asked at cabralsupportgroup.com because to be honest, I don't want you to wait 12 weeks, but nobody reads these questions except me. So no one's going to be able to get you back the answer that you want faster than 12 weeks. And again, it does say that at stephencabral.com forward slash ask Cabral. All right, Daryl's up next. Hi, Dr. Cabral. Great show. Thank you for this. It's been a life changer for me, my family and my friends. I'm writing from Tobago. I've used your search bar before asking and haven't seen anything on Makuna or Shilajit I heard they're both used in Ayurvedic medicine. What are their benefits? And do you recommend it or for, say, a male in his late 20s? So I've actually spoken about both of these before, probably just maybe not listed in the, you know, as the exact term. So I believe in both, but I don't, I would never just use them to use them, right? I mean, like, that's not something that I, w- I typically do in my practice. I use supplements if it needs to be added to your body for a very specific reason. So the Makuna would be, it's also called the the velvet bean. And that's something that we've used before in my practice, but we don't use it for uh, a lot of people. And the reason is that it's going to help, it's going to be a precursor to help with dopamine. So if you need more dopamine production, I always ask why, you know, why the low dopamine? So there's that. And some people are just on a super low carb diet. They're overly stressed for too long, chronic stress. So there could be that reason. And then the the Shilajit, which I'm a huge fan of, is basically loaded with a lot of minerals. The problem with that is that since it's earth grown, you need to make sure that it's not also high in heavy metals because some of them are higher in heavy metals. So I'm a big advocate of both of those. For a male in his late 20s, would I recommend them? Most likely not. I mean, I don't usually see low dopamine in males in their 20s, uh, nor do I see a a great need for a longevity-based supplement at this time in Shilajit, even though I'm a huge fan of that product. So, Daryl, hopefully that answers your question. Javier is up next. Dear Dr. Ball, my name is Javier. Let me get rid of your last name so nobody sees that last name. 24 years old from Peru, South America. It was hard to find a person that finally understands my symptoms, but finally I found you so far from my country. Let's get to the point. I've been following a candida diet for about three months at the request of my doctor. I experienced some kind of improvement in the first month, but I felt little progress since then. I continue with the same symptoms strong fatigue, muscle pains, difficulties from just getting up out of the chair, walking in any kind of movements, long list of food sensitivities. But surprising fact for me is I have so many difficulties in talking to people and reading, and I also get very easily sick and frequently out of nothing. I've listened to your podcast. I've run organic acids whose results will come in two weeks. My question is, can I expect these weird symptoms that have deeply worried me? I'd also love you to tell me what source of carbohydrates I'm allowed to eat during the candida protocol. I've been on keto for three months, seems too long for me, and I did a T3 profile a couple weeks ago at 1.81. Thank you so much. Okay, great question, Javier, and I'm happy to answer that for you. It sounds like you're experiencing something called myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is what I had, one of the things that I had. And this is a real breakdown in the mitochondria of the cells, a lack of ATP production that affects both the body and the brain, which makes it very difficult to concentrate. I had all of this while trying to take SATs to get into college and finish up my senior year of high school. It was quite, quite brutal. The good news is that you can get better. And I absolutely believe that. And I've seen it many, many times in my practice. Now, I do have to let you know, 
typically people get better from this at about a rate of 10 to 15% or so per month. I don't want to have that be a nocebo effect, which means if it isn't this, you could certainly get better in six weeks. You know, you get better in a faster amount of time. Everyone has their own timeline. It depends on how long you've been sick. Here's the nice thing is though, within six months to a year, you completely be back to your old self, feeling great again. The keto diet is not the way to go for this. And the candida and bacterial overgrowth protocol that we have lists all of the foods that you can eat and you'll be happy to see there are plenty of fruit, vegetable, as well as starch on there that do not feed yeast and candida. It's a state-of-the-art candida and SIBO-based shopping list. So that uh, should answer your question and just know that you're not alone in this. Even if you have you know, haven't really met anyone like yourself, I had never met anyone like this before. But now that I'm obviously in active practice, I see people like this all the time. It takes time. Your body's an organism. It is literally a living, thriving organism that needs time to heal. And those red blood cells, which contain a lot of the mitochondria, they don't turn over for 16 weeks, about 120 days, four months. So that means that, you know, it'd it be a lot of pressure on you to just say, I'm going to be better within the next two weeks when that's not realistic. You know, feed your body what it needs to produce more of the ATP. And part of that is glucose. Now, should you eat a lot of high carbs? Should you eat a lot of, you know, high glycemic foods? No, because you, you're probably dealing with some blood sugar dysregulation. So listen to your body. Our team will give you our recommendations on our end, and you'll begin to rebuild your body while reading maybe a little bit more about myalgic encephalomyelitis, taking it easier on your workouts for right now, getting your body back in the parasympathetic nervous system and allowing itself to heal. Do not overdo it right now. Your body's in a healing-based state. All right. Good luck, Javier. I know that you'll, you'll be able to do it. Sonny's up next. Sonny's asking, hi there. I have two questions. I think I'm a Vata Pitta body type, primarily Vata and I'm struggling to lose weight. In your podcast about diet plans, the Vata plan is geared more towards those who lose weight easily. However, I need a plan that focuses on losing weight. So would starches in the morning and grounding foods still be okay on the diet? Can you give me more tips for Vata weight loss? Also, will you be offering the Dosha body type analysis service to listeners? In one of your previous podcasts, you mentioned that we could send photos for your team for analysis and come back with a correct dosha body type. I would love this. So Sonny, we do plan on offering that service in the future. As of right now, we simply do not have the bandwidth. I, like I said before, one of my greatest goals is, is if I never needed to sleep, <laughs> you know, that I would love to be able to do all of these things. I, honestly, I love doing um, dosha assessments and I do them every single day as I literally walk down the street. I'm like, oh, kafavada. You know, like that's like how my mind works. And of course, everyone that I see in my practice. Right now, it's only offered for private concierge clients of the practice. It's all we can keep up with right now. And so as we're reading their labs, people who do the three appointments, then they can send in their photos. And obviously we can do that on a consultation. It does not sound like you're primarily Vata. A lot of people believe they're Vata because of the mindset. And that's why all these online quizzes are absolutely incorrect. So the problem is the Vata will lose weight essentially without trying. Now, there are a few things of why the Vata may not lose weight, and that's alcohol, toxicity, chronic stress. But for the most part, it's a kapha imbalance. No one's ever suffering from a vata imbalance with weight gain. So a kapha imbalance is when the body begins to gain weight, okay? So what we need to do is a kapha pacifying diet because right now you've gained more weight than you feel appropriate. So how can I tell you how much to eat? Well, typically what we're doing is a little bit of berries in a smoothie in the morning. We're doing a little bit of starch at lunch and then none at dinner. We're doing our veg vegetables at every meal, but mainly at dinner. There's no way I'd be able to customize it for you. I don't know your height. I don't know your weight. I don't know how much overweight you are. I don't know how often you exercise. These are all things that we custom tailor for people. Not possible for me to know. However, I gave you how to do this by doing a 21-day Dr. Ball Detox. That's my highest recommendation. And then after you come off the 21-day Dr. Ball Detox, you listen to a podcast called How Not to Retox After Detox and How to Transition Off a Low-Carb Diet. That will allow you to ease back into carbohydrates, which teaches you exactly how many carbohydrates your body tolerates. So you can see there's never an all-for-one plan, but doing this and using this information will allow you to know exactly what your body can tolerate in this time. And then in the future, maybe you exercise a little bit more, maybe you boost that metabolism, thyroid, adrenal, all the hormones are working great. You might even be able to eat more carbs in the future. So check out all the information, 21 Day Dr. Ball Detox, followed by those podcasts I recommended. 
Adrian's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Do you recommend have any feedback on air candling? I did it for the first time a couple weeks ago with positive results. But I would appreciate your thoughts. I was surprised it hadn't come up in 900 episodes. I'm 37 years young and getting younger every day. I'm happy to hear that, Adrian. Now I am armed with your knowledge. The concept of removing toxicities, replacing deficiencies, and rebalancing the body has been transnational for my family. Thank you. Transnational, transformational. I put probably just uh, one of those autocorrect typos. So thank you, Adrian, for writing in. I've done air candling before. Do I recommend air candling? I don't know that it's necessary. I'm not totally against it if done correctly, but again, I don't have a big need for it, nor do I use it in my practice. So I think that's why it's never come up because I've never recommended it to anyone because I haven't seen a need for it. We use the Nutribiotic Air Drops for air-based infections. We use the garlic uh, oil drops as well. Or if we need something very, very strong, we'll use a little bit of the 3% hydrogen peroxide, a couple drops. And then, of course, if the air is producing a lot of wax, well, then we can also clean out that wax. That's why I've never recommended air candling. So I, I can't give you a good answer. If you like it and you got good results then I'm not going to say not to do it. How often would I do it? Well, not too often. I, don't, I just don't think we need to be doing air candling too often. So apologize. I can't give you the best answer for that, but I appreciate you tuning in. All right, let's see if we can get in one more question. Anonymous is up next. Is it possible to get rid of my IgE food or environmental sensitivities? I've gone through some of your podcasts where you discuss IgG sensitivities going away after healing the gut, but does that apply to IgE reactions as well? I don't have the financial means to run the lab testing at this time or see a functional medicine practitioner, but I'm curious to know if, in general, IgE allergies can theoretically go away. If not possible for IgE allergies to go away, is it okay to eat the foods I'm mildly allergic to, or would they still cause inflammation? Great question, Anonymous. So the answer is yes on both accounts. So you can actually do, and you can do sublingual allergy drops for IgE sensitivities. And it's different than the injections because there aren't as much, some of the injections contain heavy metals and mercury. That These are more for, when I talk about the sublingual, am I saying that correctly? Under your tongue, okay? <laughs> Under your tongue. Sublingual, I believe. I don't know why it's not registering in my brain properly right now. But they'll do drops for your environmental allergies. And people get great relief from this in terms of your grass, your mold, your pollen, uh, your dust mites, etc. Now I've seen IgE go down as well. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to remove. So, you know, it, when in doubt, remove that food for a minimum of 12 weeks. But if it's a high sensitivity, ideally six months. What you do is you allow for your immune cells to not engage with that particular protein, which can then calm the immune system. I will let you know, even if it's a mild or moderate sensitivity, every time you do eat that food, even though there's not an anaphylactic-based reaction, there's an inflammatory-based reaction because your body's attacking that protein, and because it's attacking that protein, it's creating inflammation. It's a little war zone in there. It's a battle going on, which is going to create inflammation. So what I would say is this. Do your initial elimination, and then after 12 weeks, maybe eat that food once per week. Just start to gradually add it in, if that, or it might just be an every once in a while thing. Hard for me to give you exact recommendations on this without seeing any of your labs, but I understand your position. So what I would say is, if you can, just eliminate it for six months. And then in six months from now, you're going to add it back into your diet. Hopefully, there'll be no issue there. If you have environmental allergies, well, again, seal up that gut. Calm the immune system. Begin to add in more zinc and vitamin C and your B vitamins. Detoxify your body. Do all of the things in the book, The Rain Barrel Effect. And when you do that, just hopefully like myself, you'll begin to see those allergies go away. Seal the gut. Detoxify the body. Boost the immune system in a proper way. And um, I think you're going to get a lot of benefits. So thank you for writing in. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into today's Cabral Concept. And this host call, we'll be back tomorrow answering more of our community questions. Take care, everyone. Have an amazing weekend. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. 
You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.